in front of all of the data. All right, so yesterday, in terms of our notes, we started off talking about blood, and we talked about two of the um, main components of blood. What did we, what did we talk about yesterday? Sophia? Oh. oh yeah, two days ago. Yeah, we talked about two of the components, plasma and red blood cells. Just uh, remind us, the plasma is the liquid portion of blood. It sort of suspends everything else so it can actually flow through blood vessels. Um, also carries lots of different things in it, hormones, right? um, lots of dissolved carbon dioxide in the form of bicarbonate, um, and various other factors, the red blood cells, the platelets, and so on. Okay, then red blood cells, we know, are the main oxygen carriers of the cell, of the body. They contain hemoglobin, which has which important mineral? Iron. 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 Has iron is that central um, atom that helps it bind to oxygen to carry it from one place to another. What, was it, what else was unique about red blood cells? Yeah, that they're anucleated. They don't have a nucleus. The nucleus um, disappears when they're being created in the bone marrow. Um, and so that's, that's unique. All right, so we have two more components of blood, really, that we need to talk about. Um, the platelets and white blood cells. Okay. So we'll start with the platelets. You guys remember what the function of platelets are? Yes. It's clot blood. Yeah, it's for blood clotting. Platelets are responsible for the clotting of our blood. And platelets are not really cells. Okay? They're cell fragments they're referred to as. Um, they don't have all the organelles and so forth. But they're floating around. Um, they're smaller than red blood cells. Okay? You can see them here, um, these little fragments. And in a couple cubic millimeters of blood, there's about 250,000 platelets smaller than red and white blood cells, and they are responsible for the clotting of our blood. Oh, that's so we don't bleed to death. Yeah, and clotting is important. You know, I think sometimes we hear about clotting in a, a negative um, context because sometimes there are issues with blood clotting. But blood clotting is very, very important to uh, keeping us alive. Okay? Uh, these platelets are produced in the bone marrow, like red blood cells and white blood cells. And there's a, there's a series of enzymes and coagulation factors that are present in our blood. We're not going to get into too many of those details. It's quite actually complex. Um, but the process of our blood clotting, it does require vitamin K, okay? and that's important. And that's one of the reasons we need vitamin K in our diet, is that uh, if you have a lack of vitamin K deficiency, then you are not going to have proper blood clotting. Okay? Um, there are also genetic disorders in which the platelets don't function properly. And um, it's called hemophilia as a general term for a disease in which your blood does not clot properly. And it's a problem because when people's blood doesn't clot, an injury can lead to excessive bleeding. Um, bruising happens very easily because that's what bruising is. It's bleeding uh, underneath the skin. Um, and so it could be a lack of platelets. It could be a lack of certain enzymes, one called thromboplastin, that lead to this disease. And it's a, often a genetic, certain types of hemophilia are a genetic disorder. Um, it runs in families. Um, the royal lines, I believe, um, in England were, um, were affected by hemophilia because there was a lot of, um, of um, marrying cousins and close relatives that sometimes recessive um, diseases can become more and more common. And that's one of the reasons why um, generally inbreeding is, is not done is because the buildup of recessive diseases and disorders uh, can become more and more common because it's more likely they're going to be there. Um, there's also, and, and you may probably have heard of, of clotting by um, these uh, next two situations, which is when the blood forms clots at the wrong times or in the wrong places. 
Now, there are all sorts of enzymes and factors that control blood clotting to make sure blood clots don't form when they shouldn't. But there are times when they do. Um, and two of the terms we're going to use are thrombus. Okay, this is when there's a clot inside attached to a blood vessel um, that blocks the flow of blood through that blood vessel. Obviously, if we build up a clot on the interior of an artery, um, that's going to reduce the flow of blood, just like the buildup of cholesterol or plaques narrows um, an artery. Well, if it's a blood clot, a thrombus that's causing that, it can narrow blood flow as well and eventually even block it. Um, an embolus is another blood clot, but this is a floating blood clot okay, that sometimes forms for some reason inside of a uh, person's blood vessels. And that can be dangerous because as this clot, um, if it doesn't dissolve, if it's sort of floating around through the circulatory system, it can get stuck in an area and cut off the flow of blood. Now, if that happens to your brain or if it happens to a cardiac artery in your heart, then it can cause a heart attack, or if it's in your brain, it can cause a stroke because you're losing the flow of blood to those parts because this embolus has blocked those things. Um, and so sometimes people that are having blood clots um, form can go on various medications. Sometimes they're called a blood thinner, like heparin is one. Um, and a person that's on a medication like that can help prevent that from happening, help dissolve those blood clots, but at the same time, they have to be careful in terms of injuries um, because they will bleed more excessively because that medication is, is lowering their ability to form blood clots. So what is it called when your brain floods with blood? Floods with blood? Um, I don't, yeah. You may be thinking about an aneurysm, a rupture in a blood, in a blood vessel that leads to you know, bleeding in the brain. It could be something like that. All right, so the process is very, very complicated. And this may sound complicated, what I'm going to tell you, um, but it's actually much more complicated in real life. So blood clots are not supposed to form unless there's some sort of damage, some sort of injury. And what happens here, if I go back a second, is once there's damage, so here we have a blood vessel. There's obviously been some damage. That's why light's shining through, I guess. Um, and obviously a person would bleed. Okay. Um, and so these are the platelets. And what happens, once there's damage, all of a sudden those damaged shells release certain factors that cause platelets to start to attach to that site okay? and start to form sort of a little um, block so that the bleeding slows down. Okay? And after there's a series of other reactions that happen afterwards that cause a network of fibers to form to really seal that up and form the full blood clot. So that's what we're talking about here. So obviously if there's damage to a blood vessel, a tear in a blood vessel or something, well, then that needs to be fixed. That the bleeding needs to be stopped, okay? And so the damaged cells, now I, want, I changed a word in here um, because on your copy it said um, release, correct? Yeah. yeah. I don't like the accuracy, so I, I changed it to activate. It's, it's just a minor change. It's not going to make a big difference, but um, it's more accurately to say it activates an enzyme. So when cells are damaged, there's a tear in a blood vessel. Okay? There's several things that happen. First, the damaged um, part of the blood vessel has exposed collagen. Okay? And when that starts to come in contact with our blood, platelets, that's their signal, sort of. There's been some damage. Platelets start to attach to that site, and they change. They become sticky. They become very spiky, which causes more platelets to attach to that site, which they become sticky, and more platelets attach. And it's sort of this positive feedback loop where more platelets and more platelets are increasing to build up and sort of um, close up that blockage. So those platelets form. Also then, okay, there are damaged cells which release um, enzymes called thromboplastin is an enzyme, and that gets released into the blood. Okay? And that causes a series of enzyme mediated changes to happen. Okay, this thromboplastin, is, along with calcium ions, converts one form of an enzyme, prothrombin, into an activated form, thrombin. So normally, prothrombin is floating around in the blood. But once it is activated by this enzyme, it changes into an enzyme called thrombin. And this is the one that's going to have an effect on another um, 
on another molecule. Thrombin then has an effect on this other um, molecule, fibrinogen. This is, again, also usually just floating around in our blood, you know, just kind of hanging out. But then once it is affected by thrombin, it changes. It goes from being soluble and just being dissolved in our plasma to insoluble. And it forms these strands, this mesh, okay, called fibrin. And this mesh covers over those platelets that clumped up. It reinforces them. It also starts catching other things. It catches red blood cells. It catch, catches white blood cells. And it's building up okay, that blood clot. Okay? And eventually it's completely um, closed up. Bleeding stops. Eventually if it's, uh, it dries out. If it's on the outside by it dries out. And that's what we call a scab. Okay? A scab is basically a combination of red blood cells that were trapped by platelets and this fibrin and white blood cells and all of those things um, are what form a scab. Wait, why is there scarring? On a scab, just because sometimes as the head, depending on the, um, how large the damage is, as our skin heals over that um, wound, it does, sometimes doesn't heal smoothly. Or if you like constantly pick at something, at a scab or something, then that skin like heals a little bit, then you take it off, it heals a little bit more, and it builds up sort of scar tissue. And that's what a scar is. So the purpose of all of this complex enzyme is that we don't want our blood clotting when it doesn't need to. And so all these enzymes there, this cascade of one enzyme activating another, make sure it only happens at the proper time. Okay. All right, any questions about platelets or blood clotting? Now here, to help you remember, because it's confusing, right? You got prothrombin and thromboblastin and fibrinogen and fibrin. Um, maybe to help, helps me remember is that the shorter word is always like the activated form. Like thrombin is the activated form of the enzyme. Fibrin is the activated form that's actually doing the work. The longer names are sort of the precursors, the inactivated forms. Fibrinogen, prothrombin. All right, let's talk about white blood cells. Leukocytes is the technical term for them. Have you heard of a type of cancer that affects white blood cells? Leukemia. Leukemia, okay, it's cancer of the white blood cells. Um, that's where it comes from, because the white blood cells are called the leukocyte. And white blood cells are our immune system. They form the majority of our bodies resistance to infection and pathogens. White blood cells are nucleated. They have a nucleus. It's often has strange shapes. Sometimes there are multiple nuclei. It's one of the ways we classify types of white blood cells is by their, um, by their nucleus and what it looks like. And a drop of blood might have seven to 10,000. Okay. They're similar in size, or some of them are much larger than red blood cells. Okay? Um, and the numbers change. When do you think the number or the proportion of white blood cells is altered? When you get sick? Yeah, you know, when you have an infection. The number of white blood cells increases quite a bit to help fight off that infection. In fact, if you ever go to the doctor and they need to do blood work, they might order a CBC. It's a complete blood count. What they're looking at, at your blood, What's the proportion of red blood cells to white blood cells and so forth? And so if you have an elevated number of white blood cells, and they tell the doctor you have an infection somewhere, maybe they haven't identified it yet, but those elevated white blood cells are often a sign of some infection or some other problem. And there's a bunch of types of white blood cells. You really don't need to know the fine details here. What you really should know in terms of what we're gonna be, have on our quizzes and tests are um, the phagocytes, um, versus the lymphocytes. But there are many, there's monocytes, um, there's basophils, neutrophils, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and they all have different functions and, and um, different purposes. Um, they all work together to fight infection, but we'll stick to sort of the basics here, okay? So the first one, you could probably guess what these do. Phagocytes. Yeah, so what do you think they do? How do they help our immune system? What, what they, might they do? Yeah, they engulf 
through phagocytosis, bacteria, or other cells, and destroy them. They're like almost like an amoeba. They're amoeba shaped. They have pseudopods that they use to engulf pathogens. Okay, um, so that's their purpose. And it's not just I say bacteria here. It would be other pathogens as well, like viruses. Um, but um, they are located throughout the body in various types of tissue, and their job is to destroy any pathogens. They can leave blood cells to fight those infections. They increase in number. It can go from 20,000 to a million at the site of an infection. And so they're, they're important. They, they engulf and, and kill those bacteria. How do they know what to destroy and what not to destroy? I don't have any idea about that. How does a... How does a um, monocyte know that it should kill this bacteria but not this blood cell? Is there about like the memory or something on it? Um, well, that memory comes in a little bit later with the other types. Sophia? Maybe antibodies or antigens? Antigens. Okay. Our blood, all of the cells in our body have specific antigens, proteins stuck to the memory and saying, hey, don't hurt me, I'm one of you. But when a foreign cell, a foreign pathogen gets into the body, your immune system recognizes that, hey, this doesn't have an antigen identifying it as part of me, I'm going to destroy it. Nate? Are the uh, names in the parentheses just another name for phagocytes? No, those are different types of phagocytes. Types of yeah. Okay, so neutrophils, monocytes, those are the two that are phagocytes. What happens when an antigen that, that is not part of the body enters on bacteria or something? Like an antigen that is recognized by a as as foreign? No, like as as self? Yeah, but it's not. Well, they usually aren't. I mean, there are you know, if a person gets a transplant, they have to match their um, some of those things like blood type and other antigens. But they also need to take immune immunosuppressant drugs so that their body doesn't attack these transplanted organs. Um, so just this is a this is um, a neutrophil. Okay, and it's engulfing, destroying these orange uh, bacteria. Have another one, yeah. And uh, this is a monocyte. Okay, sometimes called a macrophage, and you can see it's attaching and, and destroying, grabbing onto, and engulfing these bacteria. All right, lymphocytes are the other type of white blood cell. Okay, and lymphocytes, um, you could see them them here. They're the, so these are red blood cells. These are lymphocytes. You can see they stain darker because they have the nucleus. Why do you think the red blood cells are lighter in the middle? Because it's thinner. Yeah, no, it's because it's thinner because of their shape. The outsides are thick and the inside is very thin. Um, so lymphocytes, there again, are, are many types of lymphocytes. B cells, T cells, natural killer cells. Um, and they all have very complex functions within our immune system that we are not going to get into. They all have a different role to play. They, some um, are responsible for defending against various um, pathogens. They also, this is where antibodies are produced. Lymphocytes produced in the bone marrow. They're processed in lymph tissue, and they're mostly found in our lymphatic system. So some are found in our blood, in our plasma. Most of them are found in our lymphatic system, in lymph nodes, in the lymph fluid that goes through our body, in our lymph vessels. Okay? And they help to coordinate sort of the general immune response when we have an infection, and they also are responsible for giving us long-term immunity against um, certain pathogens. And they do that by producing antibodies. So I just mentioned antigens are little proteins on the outside of the cells identifying them basically. Antibodies are special types of proteins that bind to those antigens and they can inactivate a cell. They can mark it so that another type of white blood cell will destroy it. Okay? And the reason antibodies are able to match up with antigens is because of their shape. The shape of an antibody matches the shape of the antigen. And they're specific. An antibody for us against the chickenpox virus is only specific to the chickenpox virus.
can't help if you get a cold or the flu. Antibodies are specific to an antigen that's on the surface of a pathogen. And you can see that in this picture. Antibodies here often are Y-shaped. Here I have some pathogens. You can see they have antigens on the outside, and they match up. The shapes match perfectly. Okay? And so when antibodies bind to antigens, okay, several different things can happen. They're useful in many ways. One way is that they block, for example, in a virus. Once the antibodies attach to the outside of the virus, it can no longer enter the cell. It's blocked from entering the cell. The antibodies can start to clump up bacteria and keep them all together for um, a macrophage to come and destroy them. Okay? Um, it can take antigens out of um, our blood that are dissolved in our blood. It can take um, and ch change how pathogens enter our cells. Okay? And again, here you see they can um, release various um, enzymes into the cell that will destroy it. They can mark it for phagocytosis by a macrophage. So they're helpful in many different ways, these antibodies. And the good thing is that they stay circulating in our blood for a long time. Okay? Once we are infected with a certain pathogen, often our body can produce antibodies that protect us for a long time, sometimes even our entire life. Okay? Um, and we call that immunity. Okay? There's two types of immunity. So active immunity is when our bodies produce their own antibodies. Sometimes it lasts your whole life. Other times it may be only temporary. It may last for five or ten years. Okay? And natural immunity is when we get sick. Now, probably none of you, has anyone ever had chicken pox? I have. You have? Okay. It's you. So your post, <laughs> so most people today will never get chicken pox because when, for example, my daughter, I think Taylor, when she was getting her vaccination, my oldest daughter, she's 18, um, chicken pox just became a new uh, vaccine. Previous to that, kids all got chicken pox at some point in their life, okay? And like I got chicken pox when I was a kid, and then you never got it again. You got it one time. You got infected with it, and then you gained natural active immunity. When my, I got the chicken pox when I was a kid, I got sick, got chicken pox, but then my immune system fought off the virus, and it created antibodies. And now my immune system remembers what chickenpox um, virus, varicella virus, looks like. If someone had chickenpox and coughed on me or whatever, um, my immune system would immediately destroy those pathogens and I wouldn't get chickenpox again. I built up natural immunity. The rest of you, besides Sebastio, you have <laughs> acquired immunity, acquired um, active immunity, because you got a chickenpox vaccination. When you were a kid, you went to the doctor, and you know there's a whole series of vaccines you get as a child. And when you get a vaccine, they're injecting into you either um, a dead virus or bacteria that's no longer alive and no longer active. Sometimes it's a weakened living virus. Sometimes it's only a part of a virus, but they're injecting some portion of the weakened or inactivated virus into your body. Your immune system kicks into action. It says, hey, this shouldn't be here. It fights off these and creates antibodies against those um, pathogen pathogens that were injected into you, and then you have immunity to it, okay? Those antibodies stay in your, in your body for a long time. Now, sometimes you go for several rounds of a vaccination. Sometimes you may have to go 10 years later for a booster shot to give you um, increased immunity, but vaccinations work by giving you an attenuated, a weakened pathogen that your body can um, learn to fight against before you get the actual disease. Now there are some diseases we cannot develop vaccines for. The viruses, like the common cold, for example. Um, we don't have a vaccine that can prevent you from getting a cold. The cold virus is constantly changing and mutating. Those antigens are always changing. We don't have a good way to um, fight against them. The HIV virus, again, we don't have a, a vaccine that could prevent a person from becoming infected because that virus is always changing. So it's not simple to develop a vaccine, but it has been done. And people used to, oh, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, lastly, passive immunity, 
There are times when they actually inject antibodies into you from another person or from an animal. Okay, and that's called passive immunity. For example, te a tetanus shot, if you, get, you have to go and get a tetanus shot, that is passive immunity. They're actually in injecting into you antibodies um, from another person, from an animal. So you usually get that if you go out of the country? It's if, well, yeah, no, it's usually the uh, tetanus. Sometimes if you cut yourself on some weird object that may be infected with it. Um, there's lots of vaccines you may get after you have to travel internationally because certain diseases are common in some countries but not here. Vaccines are hugely important in the human health. Polio used to kill and permanently disable um, hundreds of thousands of people. This is the incidence of polio throughout the last little less than 100 years. Vaccines are relatively new. Okay. So, look at the incidence of polio. Okay, in 1955, okay, there were 2,000 or 28,000 cases in that year. This is the um, this is when the polio vaccine, one of the most uh, one of the first vaccines to be widely widely used, um, was instituted. Today, basically nobody gets polio in the United States. Okay, if you talk to um, your grandparents, you're well, probably not. Your great grandparents, um, polio was a serious, serious problem for people, um, and le led them to be disabled for their life sometimes. And it's basically been completely eliminated due to vaccines. Yeah, right. I thought you would like say everybody. Um, if you ever see like on somebody, maybe a, your parents might have like a scar in their arm, like little, like pretty large, like maybe dime-sized scar on their arm. That's from the initial ways that they used to do the polio um, vaccine, is they had to make a large um, uh, patch in your skin and give you sort of a large vaccine and that scarred over. They still do that in Hungary. Oh yeah, they yeah, still they do, do it, yeah. In China too, I oh, do they? Yeah. 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 Um, I'm not sure why they would use that, that form versus others, but it's interesting. Um, there are other means of preventing infection. So our immune system is sort of a last response. We have many ways of preventing our bodies from getting infected in the first place. Our skin is our first line of defense. Obviously, it prevents lots of bacteria and things from getting inside of our body. Mucus in our nasal passages, cilia in our trachea, all those things trap bacteria and so forth. Acid in our stomach helps kill many viruses and bacteria that we might ingest. Vomiting, diarrhea helps rid our system of things that could be dangerous. Tears, earwax, our gut bacteria, all of these things are helped as a line of protection to prevent us from getting um, into our body at all. And then our immune system takes over. Um, I may have to change your quiz. I, I do have to change your quiz. Perfect. Yeah. All right, it's going to be Wednesday. What? Nice. Wait. Yes. Yeah, like these are like categories. Yes, these are types. This is like a group. My dad changed his Like phagocytes are new. Yeah. 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 So he can never give blood again? No, here he can give blood. In Europe.